All right, we're all set to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eliza Chandler, and my pronouns are she and her. And I am a faculty member in the School of Disability Studies. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today and to welcome you, the panelists and the participants, to the sixth and final panel in the Sex and Pandemic Speaker Series, Variations of the Social. This series has generated and surfaced key insights and points of analysis around the relationalities between sex, sexuality, and intimacies in the context of the pandemic. And I congratulate the series organizers, Ram, Ricky, Dr. Bert, Ricky Varghese, and, and Tali Chernowski for a fantastic series. Um, so now I'll begin with the land acknowledgement. As we gather here today to listen to the speakers share their thinking, reflections on, and learn from their perspectives, and to engage in critical discussion, we acknowledge that the School of Disability Studies is on Treaty 13 territory, a treaty that was established between the Mississaugas of the Carter River and the British and the British Crown. We are surrounded by Treaty 13A and Treaty 20, which is also known as the, as the Williams Treaty, as well as Treaty 19. I speak for you today from Toronto, or the city that is currently named Toronto, um, which is the city also where the university is placed. This is the Dishbukwant Fern Territory, which is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabek, which includes allied nations to peacefully share and protect the resources around the Great Lakes. As always, the purpose of these uh, land acknowledgements are to help us pause and recognize the territory uh, um, we are on. And so if you find yourself somewhere other than Toronto right now, we hope that you are able to acknowledge where you are to acknowledge both the histories and the presence of indigenous com communities and sovereignty in the place that you call home. While those of us who are not indigenous, um, like myself, have arrived as settlers on indigenous territory, um, we come to this territory in different ways. We acknowledge that some of our ancestors and elders were forcibly displaced and brought here involuntarily by by force, particularly those um, brought here through, through the result of the transatlantic trans slave trade. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people um, and we are grateful to be working and living on this land. So with that, um, I'll, I'll now introduce Dr. Vargas. So this work comes to us today by the way of Dr. Ricky Vargas's successful Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada's Connection Grant. The talks provide a platform for critical reflection and dialogue amongst academics, students, activists, artists, and the service providers. And they bring diverse perspectives and experiences to bear on this topic. Dr. Bargais holds, holds the Dennis Stowe Postdoctoral Fellowship in Gender, Disability, and Social Justice in the School of Disability Studies. His work both complements and extends the work of the school. As an undergraduate degree completion program with a robust record of postdoctoral studies, the School of Disability Studies has a strong commitment to equity and justice for, disability, for disabled, mad, and deaf people. We are also oriented to the affirmative and desirable trouble the disability madness and deficit affords us. We work in the school with new conceptual frameworks afforded by minds and bodies of difference that provoke us to reimagine care, love, 
intimacy, health, risk, and grief, and many of the other themes that have been explored throughout this series. This series exemplifies that many of the school's commitments and under Dr. Varghese's direction, has brought together scholars from a range of disciplinary backgrounds and investments, including sociology, media studies, disability studies, queer theory, psychoanalysis, and Black studies to explore and engage thinking about sex in the time of the pandemic. So thanks again, Ricky, so much for inviting me to open the event. And now I'll, I'll turn it over to you. It is so, <clears throat> it is so much for that note of love and, and for providing the land acknowledgement, Eliza, and for being here for this speaker series. Hi, everyone. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the sixth and final panel of the Sets in the Pandemic series this afternoon. It's been a great journey, and it's wonderful to be here with all of you. As Eliza mentioned, my name is Ricky Ruiz, and I'm the Anastil Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender, Disability, and Social Justice here at the School of Disability Studies, which is housed in the Faculty of Community Services. My own research lies at the intersection of psychoanalysis, sexuality studies, debt, and disability studies. I'm particularly interested in relation and tracking the shifts and changes that have taken place within the history of sex and sexuality. My intention is that with every invasion, the history of sex gets reimagined, reconstituted, and rewritten anew. I believe this was the case with HIV AIDS, and I sense that COVID 19 too will have its impact on how we consider intimacy in the landscape of the sex world. It is with these thoughts in mind that I organized this series, and I hope that you will find the incident conversation provocative, insightful, and pushes us to think better in a critical and rigorous manner. It's been eliminating for me over the last six months, to say the least. A bit about how this afternoon will proceed. Um, after the speakers have given their thoughts, and to men, I will initiate a brief discussion between all of us to get us started. After that, we'll open up the floor for questions and comments from the audience. Now we turn it off the will field the questions and present them to the panelists. They will now give a few words about how we can ask questions or provide your comments during the discussion portion of the afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tally. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the RA for the Sex and the Pandemic series. I'm just going to go over a few access notes and I will be on screen later, as Ricky said, to read out questions from the chat. Just note that we do have live captioning today. Um, if you'd like to see that, please press the CC button that's on your Zoom menu bar. So there are a few ways for you to participate in today's panel. Uh, first, feel free to use the chat box to ask questions directly to panelists and to chat with your fellow attendees. Please note that the chat box is automatically set to send messages only to panelists. If you would like everyone to see your remarks, please click the arrow next to the to button and click all panelists and attendees before you send your text. Uh, if in the Q&A portion of the panel, you would like to speak using audio, please press the raise hand button and we will enable your microphone at the appropriate time. If you need video on to ask your question, please message me in the chat. Also, Zoom webinars have a question and answer feature. To use this feature, press the question and answer button also on your Zoom menu bar 
type your question into the Q&A box and click send. You can also choose to send this question anonymously by checking that box below the typing area. We can reply to these questions then live or in text within this window. In addition, if you'd like to use social media to engage with today's panel, please feel free to use the hashtag pandemic sex to connect with each other. We are lucky to have Fan Wu with us today, who will be live tweeting today's panel from the pandemic sex Twitter account. Okay, back to you, Ricky. Thanks for that, Sally. And now, without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker for today, um, Susanna Passonin. Susanna is Professor of Media Studies at the University of Turku, Finland, with an interest in studies of sexuality, media, and affect. She is a primary investigator of the research consortium. Intimacy in Asian Living Culture, uh, funded by the Strategic Research Council at the Academy of Finland, and most recently, author of Many Slender Events, In Insects and Play, published by Old Snets Press. Uh, NSFW, Sex, Humor, and List in Social Media, the Kyle Jarrett and Ben Light published by NIE Press, objectification on the difference between sex and sexism, lectured on the Atlet, Alan McKee, John Mercer, and Clarissa Smith, published by Rutledge. Who's Laughing Now, Feminist Tactics in Social Media, with Jenny Sunday, published by NIE Press, and Dependent, Distracted, Bored, Affective Formations in Network Media, also by MIT Press. She serves at, on the editorial boards of New Media and Society, Social Media and Society, Porn Studies, Sexualities, and International Pop Journal of Cultural Studies. Susanna's presentation is titled Isolated Bodies, Problem Exchanges. Susanna? Thank you, Ricky, for the most generous introduction. So I'm, I'm Susanna, my pronouns are she and her, um, or the Finnish Han, that doesn't really make a difference. Uh, it does not gender. I'll just share my screen. And thank you very, very warmly for the invitation. This seminar is really so beautifully uh, organized and I'm very glad to be part. And it's Friday night in Helsinki. So, in this situation uh, where we currently are, a uh, year and a half into the pandemic, um, with the social distancing and especially with the lockdowns, we've seen a sharp, sharp increase in data traffic. So in a sense, uh, what we've already known, that online platforms are key to how people come together, sexually figure things out, create proximities and distances, remain in contact or maybe, maybe do not. Um, it's become uh, exceed, exceedingly sharply into focus. As people have returned into platforms they used to use, or they've increased the use on platforms that they are attached to. Um, um, plus we've seen a boom uh, in platforms such as OnlyFans, which is probably the success story um, of the pandemic age when it comes to sexual platforms. In this situation where saliva presents an active health risk um, and when the threat of infection basically looms very close when inhaling somebody else's breath. Um, the role of network media um, as infrastructure of intimacy has grown increasingly pronounced also as an issue of public health. But this situation is deeply paradoxical in the sense that it happens in a context where social media community standards um, primarily do zone out uh, sexual communication and uh, sexual content, visual content, such as nudes, but also sexual communication on very, very broad terms, um, with the exception of Twitter and Reddit. So this wave of doing 
uh, sexuality and doing intimacy in, in multiple shapes and forms meets increasingly drastic ways in which sex is being deplatformed uh, from all kinds of social media. Uh, so, for example, um, Zoom uh, terms of use, um, they ban sharing of any content that might be sexually arousing. Uh, and of course, people get turned on by very different things. So it really is a bit opaque, I would argue. Um, and community standards tend to be uh, expansive and rather opaque. So they can use, be used in, in, in very flexible ways. And this is an ongoing discussion. And there's actually a special forum forthcoming uh, in the Journal of Porn Studies. And some of the articles are already out. Uh, Katrin Tiedenberg has a really um, good article on the general logic of deplatforming sexuality. So the logic of zoning out sex in the name of safety, it focuses on negative sexual rights, as in the right not to be harassed, which of course is key. Um, but they really pay no attention to positive sexual rights, as in, in the right uh, to access sexual information, as in the right to live a satisfactory sexual life. And in this context where where all kinds of human contacts and intimacies have become platformed, uh, the deplatforming then becomes uh, the deplatforming of sex becomes an issue of actually basic human rights. I would argue, and I have argued this before. Also, in this context, when uh, traffic to porn sites has been increasing, as has all traffic, uh, we are also faced with anti-porn campaigns. Um, fueled by the passing of the US uh, foster sister laws in 2018. So labeled as anti-trafficking, um, these uh, campaigns basically target payment systems. So they are, ta they are targeting the um, well financial infrastructures or the financial platforms uh, that support the sharing uh, of, of porn. And of course, if you can't pay, uh, with something like a credit card. Uh, that also means that people producing content can't be paid that easily. So it's really, a, it's a very paradoxical situation with the high interest in sexual content. And then these constant uh, aims to block access or, or somehow, re I mean, to remove content. There's much I could say about the Pornhub campaigns. We can come back to that. Um, there was also the case of OnlyFans uh, announcing that they would not allow porn, um, and then they backed away from that decision. But it basically speaks of how platforms, even something like OnlyFans that owes its success largely uh, to sexual content, uh, how they do not consider um, the content producers within the realm of sexuality as valuable as, for example, their celebrity uh, members and content producers. So there is an interesting way in which sexuality and sexual content is seen as lacking in value in very different, uh, on very different social media platforms. Um, and all of this is key because we've also seen uh, a centralization of online traffic. Uh, so traffic of online porn uh, has been largely, not solely, but largely fluid by Pornhub and MindGeek that owns many platforms. Uh, User-generated content has been centralized on OnlyFans and Facebook with the pandemic has 2.8 billion users globally. So we are seeing these uh, platforms having a huge amount of governmental power uh, in terms of how we can relate to each other, whether that's sexually or not, or something in between. This zoning out of, of sex uh, happens on very horizontal terms, on very broad terms, and largely to uh, automated means, uh, algorithmic content filtering. So this means that basically uh, information on sexual health, for example, uh, journalistic accounts of sex work, or discussions on, on, let's say, porn studies, academic research, they become equally zoned out um, as problematic. And here we can also see the very broad way in which Facebook uh, acknowledges discussions 
on sexual violence and exploitation. So focus on negative sexual rights in that sense. Um, but they they draw the line on content that facilitates, encourages, or coordinates sexual encounters between adults. Um, and the, the current version actually is slightly longer, but this is the key thing. So the positive sexual rights really have no place on the platform. And while this has become more clear with the Foster SESTA, uh, the policies were very similar in 2011. So it really hasn't changed all that much. So we are facing this model of non-sexual sociability or the effacement of sexuality from the realm of sociability. And I argue that this is a problem. So advertisement platforms such as Facebook don't like sex because advertisers who are their actual customers do not want to advertise next to sexual content. They want family friendly kind of ambience to happen. Um, and this is particular, I mean, this is particularly the case on, on US social media services, but also Chinese social media, TikTok, uh, they are equally strict for slightly different reasons, I would say. There's a different cultural context to consider. Because the automatic conflation, I argue, of sexuality with harm and risk as some kind of a problem broadly construed um, on something like the market leader Facebook, uh, it taps into Puritan structures of feeling um, that historically linger uh, in US culture in particular. And this uh, culturally specific attitudes towards sexuality and bodily display then become translated into kind of models of prudishness that have global, global resonances because these are global companies. What this also means is that uh, sex and porn, and all of this happens uh, in the name of safety, uh, very ephemeral notion of safety. Uh, what happens here is this kind of boundary work where social media is marked away apart from the dirty bits, uh, the porn bits. So we have social media presented as safe, non-sexual, welcoming, community oriented. And then we have porn that's somewhere else that represents unsafety, hence risk. Um, it's something to be excluded from social media and actually something best filtered out altogether uh, because it's bad socially, it's bad individually. That's how the argument, argument goes, if the argument is actually even, even made. In this environment, hookup apps, uh, for example, balancing app store rules with vernacular codes uh, foregrounding sexual content and expression are really they're doing a balancing act because uh, Apple and Google who own the large app stores and run them, um, they do serious gatekeeping uh, by banning sexual visual content. So there's this kind of a hide and seek um, and also a, I would say disconnection between what users uh, want to do with apps and, and what uh, and how, they, how the shape that the exchanges can take um, on these platforms. But this, this rift between the safe social media or safe content as allowed by Apple and Google is kind of the same logic of the data giants, Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft. They all operate with the very same uh, logic of safety equaling uh, lack of uh, nudity and preferably a shortage of sexual communication. Um, this also means that then content that features nudity or sexuality very freely falls into the category of porn, um, just like that, um, doing away with any kind of nuance. Um, and I've been working on um, online porn and porn for almost 20 years um, at this point, um, and I see this as a serious issue. Uh, it's really a bit of a problem. What also happens uh, with these expansive uh, takes on uh, content, whether it's deemed sensitive, not safe for work um, or disturbing or something else, um, because it conflates uh, all things sexual, it's particularly harmful to those already marginalized. And I'm thinking of the work of Alexander Cho um, on Tumblr, the pre-porn purge Tumblr, because 
of course, Tumblr got rid of sexual content pretty much in 2018. Um, and Cho's argument is that Tumblr was the preferred site for queer youth of color precisely because it allowed for anonymity. Uh, so the real name policies of the kinds of Facebook and Google actually, they do harm in the, in the sense of uh, enabling outing, uh, harassment and so forth. So they are shrinking spaces for different kinds of gender and sexual non-conforming uh, communities um, in, on social media. Um, and let's say the ban of Facebook on sexual communication, facilitation of sexual contact, it, you know, it has concrete uh, impact, for example, with people living with disabilities who require sexual facilitation. And if any kinds of sexual facilitation is zoned out by definition, um, then communication around the topic, uh, whether that's about trying to find people or whether just sharing information, it's not going to happen. So we are facing um, a deplatforming uh, to an absurd degree. Um, I would say. Um, and what happens here and what the logic, underlying logic, I think is, is that um, sexual representation, forms of sexual communication, knowledge are ultimately seen as lacking in value uh, and importance on social media platforms. They are seen as lacking in cultural social value because they cannot be monetized because they they, are, they really don't have much monetary value for the platforms because of the logic of advertising. And then this means that forms of sociability become really cut uh, in problematic ways in the name of safety. They're trying to protect us from ourselves. And at the same time, sexuality and say, I mean, sex is uh, in, intense, on an intensely personal level, um, hugely valuable and important, just it is hugely valuable and important on a social scale, on, on the level, level of community formation um, and as a, as a political issue of alliance, identification, advocacy. Uh, all of this uh, fits very uneasily in the landscape of centralized social media economy. Now, claims made for sexual rights that we should, just as we are, um, appreciating and respecting freedom of speech as a human right on social media, that sexual rights should be considered equally fundamental to people's well-being um, and, and value, meaning general abstract human value. Um, claims made on this, uh, with this logic are likely to undo the logic of advertisement platforms in zoning out sex. But what I'm hoping for is that there's an avenue for different kind of public discussion or any kind of discussion, because for a long time we haven't seen, um, we haven't really seen critical debate connected to how social media governs sexuality. We've seen a lot of debate around political uh, polarization, hate speech, and all of this is highly relevant. Um, but I would say that there, there are real reasons why sexuality should be added into the mix. And I'll shut up now, so I won't go over time. Thank you. Um, thanks, Susanna. Um, I'm really interested to see how the conversation develops in the, in the discussion portion. Um, I feel that you provided a, a lot for us to think about. Um, our next speaker, uh, who is locked in all the way from Paris, uh, is uh, Jean Orito. Um, Jean is the author of The Logic of the Law and the Decision Between Us, Art and Ethics in the Time of Scenes. Recent publications include Isolation, Loneliness, Solitude, the COVID 19 pandemic has brought us too close to that, uh, uh, published in earlier issue 41, March to the Flame, Photography and Extinction in Capitalism and, and the Camera, published by Russo, and The Virtue and Value of Disappearance in These Birds of Animation, published by Hayworth. 
Uh, John is also co-editor of Parallax, issued in seven, volume one, on John Nancy, politics, poetics, and erotics of fiction. John is also a featured artist in exhibition, intimacy, new clear art from Berlin and beyond, at the Swiss Museum in Berlin, uh, which it's just wrapping up um, there. He is Professor of Comparative Literature, Art History, and Visual Culture at the University of Toronto. And his presentation is titled Clear Solitude, Being from the Seamers, Being Alone. John? Uh, thank you, Ricky. And uh, hello, everyone, uh, all of you who have tuned in. Um, <clears throat> I've um, written a paper that I will read. And I also want to share my screen. Okay. Taken at various points over the past year, Dean Sam Shima's two photo series, being Alone, and Zhu Vershenkin, To Give Away, enable us to conceptualize a queer ethos and erotics of finitude, in which being alone at a sex club or the leaving of things for the taking on city sidewalks prove to be existential and empirical affirmations of the sense of time perhaps especially in the midst of the current pandemic, as only ever the time that remains. In the indefinite waiting that can make the solitude of cruising ecstatic, and in the abandonment of extraneous possessions, one discovers a temporality of queer imminence as here, now, this not an historical looking backward, not an infinite progress towards some utopian future, and not exactly no future either. This is queer temporality as the jouissance of the present. To borrow a phrase from Jean-Luc Nancy, a pure coming, avenir in the French, not future, as Nancy stresses. Jouissance of the present, that is also not succession, inheritance, duration, or becoming, but interruption, disinheritance, cessation, and unbecoming. Like the solitary figures, and rejected items that we see in Sam Shima's photographs, the contemporary, one name for which is Dean Sam Shima, is the anomalous one, the lumpen, the non-categorical and no named, that in its dedication to the absolute muteness of places and things, and their profane indifference to language and image is the exigent of a queer ethos of finitude. As the very existent of the time that remains, the contemporary is the irrelevant one, the excluded one, the one that does not invoke or speak about queer existence, but simply lives it yet lives it precisely as the inoperative detachment from its actuality and current conditions, along with its attention to what of life will infinitely remain unlived. As Agamben states, quote, the intention to this unlived is the life of the contemporary. And it is in this attention to the unlived that the contemporary puts life to a new and inappropriable use. 
As I embarked on this attempt to conceptually link solitude and things as the time that remains, I marveled at the sheer coincidence of a single artist currently creating two bodies of work that together present this very hypothesis. For me, it's almost as though the very existence of this body of work is at once the instantiation and confirmation of my argument, all the evidence I would ever need in order to make my case, which in turn tempts me to transpose the respective titles onto the other series of images, such that the sex club interiors would be labeled to give away and the boxed items on the sidewalk would be titled being alone. The persistence of cruising during the pandemic is enabled by the fact that you can do it alone and in public and outdoors, but also in nearly empty indoor spaces as evident in Sam Shima's photographs, where there is spacing and partitioning between bodies. Hence, the advocacy of glory holes on the part of public health departments as prophylaxis, something like wearing a mask while giving a blowjob. What this also points to is separation and exclusion as fundamental and irreducible to the ontology of sex and erotics, pleasure and jouissance. It is because of this that I now want to turn to an article by Adam Phillips, recently published in the London Review of Books, titled On Being Left Out, which is an extended meditation on exclusion as ontological to existence. It is at the juncture of the profanity and perversity of being alone as evidenced in Sanshima's photos and the non-redemptive negativity of being left out as theorized by Phillips, that I locate what I am calling the ecstatic pleasure of queer solitude. Phillips is not only speaking about being excluded, but also about excluding oneself. Often it is the case that when one excludes oneself, no one notices. Why? Because sociality is built upon the logic of recognition, which is fought for and in the name of identity, a battle waged to find a means of being included. But as Phillips argues, noticing one's own exclusion might be the source of self-recognition. Yet now, as a self without mastery, authority, or power, being nobody rather than somebody, as Dean Spade might put it. This is the existential condition of whatever singularity in its solitude, in which living is being at odds with oneself. In turn, we might ask with echoes of Alex Dutman, what does it mean to be at odds with COVID? To be left out, not of the pandemic, but to be left out in the pandemic. And is the latter always necessarily such a bad thing? The always already left outness that I am conceptualizing is not reducible to the historical or the sociological, but as I said, is ontological, as much as it is also psychological and psychoanalytic, hence Phillips and his argument. Psychoanalytic in the sense of Freud's notion of the death drive as opposite the life drive the latter of which includes the desire for self-actualization. 
As Phillips points out, quote, both insist, that is Kafka and Freud, that being and feeling left out are human problems and that no one is or has ever been excluded from the experience of being left out. The motto here might be, I am excluded, therefore I am. The current pandemic has returned us to this a priori condition, to the exclusion that is inherent to existence. In other words, existence is what it means to not belong. And it is this essential non-belonging that renders the sense of the common as always the impossible sense of the common, as Bill Haver has argued. In being the ethical affirmation, in being the ethical affirmation that the people are missing, non-belonging is also the limit of a politics of democracy. In a pandemic, the ethical question is how the demos, the people, is and is not affected in any way across the globe or the world of who is included, who is excluded. We are all fully aware that loss and death are two events that return us to our existential exclusion. Desire is another, including sexual desire. For sex is by definition, and not just theoretically, but also in terms of anyone's experience, a matter of always being left out of the sexuality and desires of others. If not all others, then certainly most others. No matter how virtuously promiscuous you fashion yourself to be. Sex, the actual experience, is antithetical to equity and inclusion. One is never more exclusionary as when having sex. Whether the bedroom or the bathhouse, sex spaces are exclusionary spaces. In the psychoanalytic tradition, sexuality is not simply one form of exclusion it is exclusion's very first scene, what Freud called the primal scene. Adam Phillips comically describes the primal scene as the first party we're not invited to. Any pandemic, and more specifically, any sex in any pandemic, is therefore about a series of non-mutual desires, for instance the desire to exclude others, the desire to be left out, safety and security, to be a winner, that is to not contract the virus, to survive the virus, and the desire to put an end to being left out, to not be deprived. This is exactly where, as I've already suggested, the ethical question arises. What does one do with the feeling of being left out? Do you take a negative route and in turn exclude what has excluded you? This is, as Phillips explains, the position and action of the tragic hero. Vindictive revenge that in fact makes exclusion permanent. Yet there's a more positive and less tragic response to exclusion, one that enables us to talk about an ethics of solitude, of being excluded and not being vindictive about it. With this decision come certain benefits, if you will, of being excluded. And I won't um, uh, go over these, but you can read them there. In sum, 
It is about treating the pandemic as a primal scene, that is a scene of exclusion, that, as I've pointed out, is, via sex and sexuality, a return to one's originary exclusion, and hence to one's most radical desires. Those that cannot be assimilated, those that are inappropriate, perverse, and profane. Such queer moments of solitude are those moments when, as we see in San Shima's photos, one's being left outness is not covered over or masked by the desire for identity and inclusion. Precisely due to the converging senses of plenitude and exclusion, cruising and other forms of promiscuity are rarely driven by the fear of missing out. Promiscuity is about anybody, but not about everybody. A non-totalizing desire that we might think of as a distinction between two prefixes, the epi of epidemic and the pan of pandemic. It's precisely in the difficulty of being able to tell if Sanshima's sex club photos were taken before or during the pandemic, that we arrive at a sense of the undecidable that is precipitated by scenes of queer solitude. Scenes of exclusion that are neither the included exclusion of bare life nor excluded inclusion of the example at the heart of Agamben's uh, elucidation of sovereignty and the biopolitical pr production of the homo soccer. Instead, we are dealing here with the excluded simply put, the infidel, the loner, the invert, the pervert, the clandestine, the exiled, and the outcast. As we clamor to be included once again, we might do well to pause and consider the threefold quality of exclusion in sex and sexuality. It draws you out of your solitude. It can exclude and make you feel excluded, but it can also at the same time return you to your solitude. I close then with a few lines from Tori Peters' recent brilliant novel, Detransition Baby, where I rewrite uh, these lines to affirm the essential solipsism of sex as the very means of creating intimacy out of queer solitude. You can see the original at the top, and then there's my rewrite, which reads, People have sex for a shared joy of exclusion that keeps an existential loneliness tied to intimacy. So when she disappeared inside herself while having sex, her more experienced uh, partners sensed that absence and her disappearance did not hurt them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John, for that beautiful paper. Um, it's very evocative and very, um, and very difficult to see how uh, everyone responds to that in the discussion. Um, and so I want to move on to our final speaker this afternoon. Um, our final speaker for the panel, and also for the series, uh, is uh, Zoral Florencio. Uh, Zoral is senior lecturer in history of modern and contemporary art and visual culture at the University of Exeter in the UK. His interdisciplinary research draws from visual culture, performance studies, career studies, the post-humanities and the medical humanities in order to probe the permeability of bodies, human and non-human, material and symbolic, to one another, approaching them as porous media interfaces, 
Jalal is the author of their back poem, Horace Nestle is Clear Futures, the ethics of the Common Pit, that was published by Lutheran in many, many. Jalal thought his title, Wild Intimacies, Sex, or the Replication of Unruling. Hello? Hello, hi, uh, Ricky, and, and thank you so much for, for, for the invitation, and thank you to everyone at the School of Disability Studies. Uh, it's a fantastic series and a really important series, and I'm really honored to be here, and especially in the company of, of uh, John and Susanna, um, I feel really, really lucky. So I will share my uh, screen. And this should work. Uh, one second. Okay. And I will also read a paper that I that I wrote. Okay, so in a letter to Dick Kriegman, dated 16th July 1987, Jack Fritcher, a gay writer and former editor of the US gay leather magazine Drummer, included the text to, of the obituary he had written for Al Shapiro, uh, who was Kriegman's partner, and who had died of AIDS-related causes earlier that year. In the text, which would appear in Drummer later that August, Fritcher wrote an eulogy of Shapiro in which he took readers through the life of the artist who had once uh, been the artistic director of the magazine and who Shapiro credited with, um, with having played the fundamental role in putting drama on the map of 1970s gay pop culture. Truth is the best eulogy, Shapiro claims a few lines in. Yet as the obituary progresses through and past a printed interview between the writer and the artist, it ends with a paragraph that adopts a register that is both more poetic and speculative than the truths normally written into history by means of eulogies. Speaking not uh, to the matters of fact of the past of a dear friend who had just died, but to the future of all those yet unborn who would come after him, Fritcher writes. With so much death, this side of Venice, the world gives little safe access anymore to unbridled desire. But desire's memory burns in my heart and mind. I know, I swear I know, despite the, the growing roles of the dead, the world has not heard the end of us. If and when the last one of us lies dying in some cold fluorescent hospital, I guarantee, I do, I do affirm, the last sound he will hear echoing from down the long corridor, the sound that will cheer his ears and his valiant heart, will be the first cry of a brown spanking neonate, a new little baby boy born as we were, gifted innately with our special ways of love. And in him, in that boy child, our kind will find a new Adam and begin the begin all over again. AIDS was to Fritzsche what cholera had been to Gustav von Aschenbach in Thomas, Mann, uh, Thomas Mann's death in Venice. That is just like cholera in the novella, AIDS had been ignored or at best poorly responded to by political authorities. Most importantly, the political response to AIDS also resonated with the secrecy through which homosexual men had historically lived their passions, their surrenders to what Fritcher called unbridled desire. Just like for Aschenbach, the hidden cholera that was assailing Venice resonated with the secrecy of his love for Tazio. For passion like crime is antithetical to the smooth operation and prosperity of day-to-day -day existence, and can only welcome every loosening of the fabric of society, every upheaval and disaster in the world, since he can vaguely hope to profit thereby. 
And so Aschenbach felt a morose satisfaction at the officially concealed goings on in the dirty alleyways of Venice, that nasty secret which had merged with his own innermost secret. Death and overwhelming sexual passion coexisted in man's Venice as relatives to such an extent that speaking of the one without the other would be to overlook not only the self annihilating nature of both, but also our desire to undo ourselves. As Aschenbach knew all too well when considering whether to leave Venice and travel back to a safer location, leaving would only lead him back, restore him to himself. But there is nothing so distasteful as being restored to oneself when one is beside oneself. Such is the deadly pleasure, the jouissance of self-sacrifice. Yet while man's death in Venice ends abruptly with Aschenbach's body being found lifeless on the beach of the Lido, Fritcher's Venice, the Venice of AIDS-related deaths and longing for unbridled desire, includes a coda that gestures towards a new future, to a return of desire, and with it, the possibility of beginning the beginning all over again. The same year uh, Jack Fritcher wrote his obituary to Al Shapiro, Leo Berzani published his direct to my grave in a special issue of October, edited by Douglas Crimp and dedicated to the AIDS crisis. Unlike Fritcher, however, Berzani was suspicious of what he saw as the pastoralizing project of redeeming sex from its associations with death. While for Fritcher, the cry of a brand spanking neonate would signal the eventual victory of life, desire, and love over AIDS-related deaths, for Berzani, AIDS was a tragic literalization of the inseparability of sex and death and then a denial of all attempts to redeem sex by displacing the aversion caused by its sacrificial nature and recuperating it through the pastoral, pastoral fantasy of the plurality and diversity of loving object relations. In Berzani's Freudian-inspired critique of sex, sex can never sustain their subjective relations, such as those of love, community, equality, or humanism. It is exactly there that lays the value of sex according to him. Namely, in the ways sex removes us from the realm of intersubjectivity by always tending towards a radical disintegration and humiliation of the self. Because sexual pleasure occurs when the organization of the self is momentarily disturbed by sensations or affective processes somehow beyond those connected with psychic organization, sex is for Berzani always already masochistic. It undoes the self, it is self-abulation, self-shattering. In writing the force of the negative and the death drive towards the shattering of the self, sex prevents us from being one, making death the death of the self inherent to life as Alenka Zupancic uh, has argued. So this is how Berzani put it more recently in his 2018 book, Receptive Bodies. The orgasmic subject turns away from the partner who has taken him or her to climax, but who is deserted at the climatic instant. Ejaculation is an explosive implosion. It is as if inhaling and exhaling had become one as if our dialogue with and, the, and opposition to both ourselves and the world had all been condensed and annul, annulled in a pulsating self-plenitude. In sexual um, connections, um, many people seek to hide themselves from their partners at the moment of orgasm, turning to the side, looking upward, burying their head in a pillow. Our climatic aloneness is both instinctual and willed, as if an act presumed to be one of great openness to the other were repudiated or taken back at the moment when a total self-absorption might also be one of total self-exposure. The exposed face of orgasm violates a fundamental privacy of being, and it must be hidden by a somewhat gratuitous 
uh, or belated gesture of great modesty, a silent proclamation of psychic chastity. Apologies for the long quote. So that is the solipsism of sexual pleasure. Not only do we always come alone, but we always, but we also do so at the expense of ourselves. In sexual pleasure, we explode our psychic structures inwards by means of the centripetal negative force of the drive that pulls us towards the place where the, the self itself comes undone, where it, it sacrifices itself. In the words of Mary Rucci, at the fleeting moment of jouissance, there is no relation whatsoever to another person. Orgasmic jouissance, in short, neutralizes intersubjective capacity. The drive is an anti-relational force because it's, it shuns all objects. Uh, oops. So, yeah, for that reason, sex or the sexual Zupancic notes is a position that shines light over the conflicting, contradictory nature of reality because of the singular form of uh, contradiction it forces us to see, to think, and to engage with. Namely, the contradiction between that which drives us inwards outside of ourselves and the psychic structures we've developed as scaffolding for the fantasy of the social. Sex is, in that sense, deeply ontological. Hence, the value Berzani assigns to it in his 1987 essay. And hence why he writes that far from apologizing for the promiscuity as a failure to maintain a loving relationship, far from welcoming the return to monogamy as a benef beneficent consequence of the horror of AIDS, gay men should ceaselessly lament or lament the practical necessity now of such relationships. That rather than attempting to save sex by means of liberal narratives of plurality and diversity and other laudable humanistic virtues, that rather than partaking in the frenzied epic of displacement in the discourse on sexuality and on AIDS, gay men ought to realize that such salvational project is one designed to preserve us from a nightmare of ontological obscenity, from the prospect of a breakdown of the human itself in sexual intensities, uh, from a kind of selfless communication with the lower or orders of being. So there is an apparent uh, in, in inalienable, oh my God, inalienable, tension between Jack Fritcher's and Leo Berzani's positions on sex during a pandemic. While the former puts emphasis on the vision of life and love re-emerging from the remains left by AIDS, like flowers growing on ruins, the, late, the latter stresses sexual pleasure as evidence of our always already being towards death. That sex undoes the self by repeatedly and sacrificially pulling us back towards the homeostasis of a pre edible life. If for future loving sex would survive death and loss, for Berzani, sex never stops representing the internalized phallic male as an infinitely loved object of sacrifice. Sex will always already be risky, it will always already carry within it the risk of self dismissal of losing sight of the self. Yet I would like to reconcile those two seemingly contradictory positions in a, into a viral dialectic of life and sacrifice through which it is the sexual undoing of the self that creates the conditions of possibility for what Susanna calls new carnal horizons of possibility. Uh, yeah, oh, oh. Okay, to emerge out of uh, the topologies of our desires and the constellations of our pleasures. To do this, I would like to attend to the sacrificial ethics Berzani identifies in sex before exploring the ways in which they themselves mimic the very ethics of community Berzani claims to be opposed to them. Then by drawing from Lacan's Seminar 7 from Victor Turner's concept of the liminoid, and Passonen's own work on sex play, I will make an argument for the creative nature of the self-sacrificial ethics of uh, sex and therefore of sex as ontological praxis. 
By doing this, I aim to bring some light to narratives of sex and risk that have dominated public health responses to older and new pandemics. Now, in psychoanalytically inflected critiques of sex, such as those of Berzani, sex not only requires self-sacrifice, but importantly, it requires it over and over again. In Is the Rectum a Grave, Berzani identifies a similarity in the ways in which public discourse about homosexuals since the beginning of AIDS, uh, of the AIDS crisis, mimics Victorian discourses on female prostitutes. Both homosexuals and Victorian sex workers were portrayed as contaminated vessels with an ability to engage in uninterrupted sex. Promiscuity, he writes, is the social correlative of a sexuality physiologically grounded in the menacing phenomenon of the non-climatic climax. That is of a climax that always remains unable to resolve the tension that leads to it. As a result, promiscuity foregrounds sex as an irresistibly re repeated act. The realities of syphilis in the 19th century, uh, Bersani writes, and of AIDS today, legitimate a fantasy of female sexuality as intrinsically diseased. And promiscuity in this fantasy, far from, beer, from merely increasing the risk of infection, is the sign of infection. Women and gay men spread their legs with an unquenchable appetite for destruction. An unquenchable appetite, therefore, uh, can only lead to a non-climatic climax and uh, to a repetitive pursuit of a climax that will never uh, be reached. The climax Bersani associates with the permanent erasure of the self. Yet while Berzani sees the repeated pursuit of self-enduing as a form of antisocial ascesis, uh, as a desire to have done with the self and with it all relationality, Lacanians like Elenka Zupancic and Mary Ruti offer a more complex reading of the relationship between sex and psychic death. For Zupancic, death is what lurks in the very midst of sexual drives, not as their aim, she writes, but as a negative magnitude or a minus implied in them and repeated in them. Importantly and paradoxically, the drive originating in the surplus of satisfaction and ex uh, excitation does not aim at lowering or annihilating that tension and excitation, but on the contrary, at repeating it again and again. In her reading of the transition from Freud to Lacan, Zupancic sees in the sexual climax not something that appeases a pre-existing lack or need, but instead an answer that precedes the question and that therefore generates further excitation. Crucially, this minus or lack of being in the very midst of being, as Zupancic puts it, gets a positive expression in the partial objects of sexuality which through that become representatives of that negativity. Contra Berzani, therefore, Zupancic claims that the death drive cannot be described in terms of destructive tendencies that want us to return to the inanimate, but precisely as constituting alternative paths to death from those imminent in the organism itself. So as I read it, Zupancic's argument is close to that of Mary Ruti who claims that uh, the problem with ethical theories centered on jouissance, such as Berzani's, is that they involuntarily resurrect the subject in all of its solipsistic glory at the very moment of its annihilation. In contrast, Ruti writes, the subject of desire is forced to care about the contours of the surrounding world. It is forced to be curious about the world and the objects, including other people that make up that world. It is through those objects, through becoming invested in those objects outside itself, that the drive is able to generate those new paths alluded to by Zupancic, paths, paths that, while still leading us to death, after all, isn't that what life always is anyway, do nonetheless present themselves as alternatives uh, to what uh, Jose Munoz described as the quagmire of the present. So it is exactly here 
in this generative self-sacrifice that one is faced with the sexual ethics, there is reminiscent of the ethics of the ethics Lacan himself identified in his reading of the myth of Antigone. In his seminar uh, seven, uh, Lacan identifies the ultimate ethical act in Antigone's betrayal of the law of Creon and decision to bury her brother Polycinus. Antigone is the ultimate ethical act, act because it was only in defining the symbolic and sacrificing herself that she was able to paradoxically become herself in honoring her brother. In doing so, in sacrificing herself, she cracked open a gap in the symbolic, creating the conditions of possibility for the law to return in a more livable manner. As Lacan puts it, the drive as such, insofar as it is then a destruction drive, has to be beyond the instinct to return to the state of equilibrium of the inanimate sphere. Will to destruction, will to make a fresh start, will for another thing. Freud's thought in this matter requires that we that what is involved be articulated as a destruction drive, given that it challenges everything that exists, but it is also a will to create from zero, a will to begin again. So the creative ethics of undoing that I'm as associated with sex and its promiscuous reiterations is therefore to be seen not merely as a negative, as a longing to return to an inorganic state, but instead as a longing that propels us onward, like Munoz wrote of queerness. It is also a longing that propels us outward towards one another, just like Antigone was driven towards her brother and through that towards her own death, which signaled the possibility of our own beginning again not as the liberal autonomous subjects of humanism, but as something else still and or yet in the horizon. In that way, the sacrificial ethics of sex reiterates the very viral sacrificial ethics of community as intimacy. For as Roberto Esposito or Jacques Derrida and Ando Formantel have noted, albeit in different ways, Community is less about a relationship founded on the acknowledgement of discrete uh, selves having something in common with one another, but rather about the sacrificial and categorical du duty of giving, of sacrificing oneself and one's home to the strange presence of the other. Rather than being the antithesis of one another, as Bersani claimed, community and sex are both forms of sacrificial intimacy as evidenced by public health discourses that have called for an end of promiscuity in order to fight AIDS, or more recently, for social distancing as a way to fight COVID-19. The horizontal bonds of intimacy enacted in both sex and community have inherent to them the power to un undo us, as AIDS and COVID tragically remind us. Yet it is in those very same self-sacrificial -sacri self bonds that allow us, it is those very same sacrificial bonds that allow us to start again and forge new horizons of possibility, new and hopefully more capacious alternative paths in our being towards undoing. With Berzani, sex is sacrificial because it does shatter the psychic structures of the self. Sex is also a pandemic because its non-climatic climax demands that we repeat it over and over again in the hope that one day a final climax will be reached, as if sex were a virus and we were its hosts, a virus that replicates itself through us, that cuts across us and in doing so breaks us into pieces. Still the deadly pandemic that is sex only undoes the self to the extent that it creates what Passonen describes as ripples across identities, an openness of becoming where the sense of one's sexual self may be pushed towards novel opportunities, rather than being arrested by psychoanalytical origin stories of primal trauma. In that context, the replicated undoing we experience in sex is less about a bodily desire to return to a pre oedipal existence and more about the self-shattering power of the negative, creating the conditions for what Passman again describes as an improv improvisatory openness towards variation and possibility. 
by means of new bodily attunements, of new resonances, modulations, and amplifications of affects that propel us towards new bodily horizons. Sex is thus akin to the liminoid or the liminal-like phenomena Victor Turner identified as features of post-industrial societies. Like their liminal counterparts, liminal phenomena undo the self, but only to transform it into something else, to animate its ontology. However, unlike the former, they are neither about social cycles nor centrally integrated in the social structure. Instead, they are continuously generated at the level of individuals and within the spatial temporal coordinates of leisure activities. As Turner writes in a way that resonates with Bassanen's own argument, one works at the liminal, one plays with the liminoid. In the liminoid, just like in sex, the self which is normally the broker between one person's actions and another's simply becomes irrelevant. So to conclude then, rather than driving us back to the death we once were, the generative undoing that is sex propels us forward. It creatively opens up new pathways to a death we may become. And it calls upon us to do it over and over again, for only that very replication is the sign of our own living. Rather than merely imploding us in psychic death, sex replicates itself through us, invites us to die only to forge ourselves anew and then back again. It is an additive process. It adds to us by opening us to new frequencies of effective existence. To do one another and in doing so to affect, affect and be affected by each other. It joyfully moves us against ourselves and our better judgment. Sex does indeed kill us, but it also repeatedly affirms our living. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joelle. Um, that was a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation and excited to kind of talk more about that. Um, what I will ask now is that I will ask all the presenters to come back on, uh, on screen, if possible. Um, uh, and we have about 40 minutes for questions and stuff like that. Um, so I, it is, I, I want to start off the conversation uh, by asking a question. Um, one of the reasons why I organized this uh, series was because I've always thought that sex is one of the first casualties of social relations when it comes to uh, you know, conversations about illness and, um, and health. And so, you know, I've been thinking a lot about social relations uh, as they have kind of played out in the last 18 months, or maybe even more in the last 18 months. And so, you know, in listening to all of your, your very, very interesting and comprehensive papers, I was wondering if each of you could perhaps describe a bit um, about how you understand the social or the idea of the social. Um, as a result of this pandemic, or how it has evolved or changed, the, you know, the notion of what it means to be with others, or be in community with others, or to be in social relations with others. Um, I know that's a, a, a bit of a broad question, but I, I thought that, that would allow us to start the conversation.
Well, I could start. Yes, thank you. That is a big question. Uh, and it sort of depends on which social one is talking about, because I mean, if it's the local social, um, because I've been during lockdowns and everything, I've been in Helsinki, so the Finnish context and the sociability, you know, in a small country, um, I would say that the pandemic has had this very strange, um, well, maybe not strange, but an impact of creating an increased sense of sociability in a sense like togetherness uh, that has been almost like a nationalistic thing. It's it's kind of been bizarre. But then when we think about the network means of, of sociability, then that becomes something quite different. Um, and my interest, I mean, as I, I talked <laughs> quite at length, um, I've been interested in how, how the role of the sexual then becomes downplayed or even effaced uh, from how sociability becomes understood because of uh, much of network media, because we are living in an era of social media, as opposed to, let's say, 90s versions of network sociability, let's say, news groups, stuff like that. Um, it means like a corporate social framework defined um, I mean, in the services that are broadly used here through U.S. terms. So it means like, a, in a way, a clash of different notions um, of sociability in terms of location with the cultural baggage that comes with that. And then also the different ways in which sociability becomes defined, um, whether that's on, on commercial terms, um, in terms of value that is monetary value and, and so forth. But if I would be talking about the Finnish case, I mean, that probably wouldn't be of interest to anyone, really. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I would actually be interested to hear a bit about the Finnish case. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of archiving that different kind of understandings, both at national and at a global level, uh, different ways in which the socialists understood. So I would be interested in hearing a, a bit about what, 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 how it's been in Finland. Uh, so, yeah. Well, just briefly, I mean, if it's a country of five and a half million people, and when a small country that's sort of located kind of far away, <laughs> uh, when it closes all of its borders for a long period of time, uh, then it has kind of an impact that's at the same time claustrophobic but in a way there was this at least initially uh, like a wave of solidarity um, in the sense of local very concrete support um, and it's it's a welfare state so in a way appreciation of the welfare state that's been eroded with kind of neoliberal stuff uh, during the past 15 years in particular increased of course now we are in a different situation and and it's kind of it's a different thing but let's say spring of 2020 uh, it really was this kind of like you know strange cohesiveness and then of course nas nationalism starts to play a role so how is sweden doing as opposed to our neighbors in in sweden oh the swedes are dying oh look at russia so it really got this strange initial kind of like solidarity then led into this like let's compare numbers kind of competitiveness and now it's a different situation yeah that's a very simplified narrative sorry hmm now i, I might just add something again on the social in maybe as i've experienced it in the u well, first, in Berlin during the first, I guess, year of the pandemic and then in, in the UK, um, I think one of the things that I found interesting per, in the specific case of, of the UK uh, was how the social, so Susan was talking about, about infrastructures, um, about a particular kind of corporate uh, management of uh, social media uh, forms of intimacy and I think another side to that during the pandemic was the particular kind of, of sociability that was uh, sanctioned in, in the context of, of, of particularly in the UK of the places where I experienced it so in terms of 
um, how suddenly what was considered uh, legitimate forms of intimacy were very much reduced to, to a particular kind of, of um, you know, couple form and especially, you know, hetero, uh, sexual um, couple form. Uh, so all the, around around the, the idea of the family. Um, and the, the disregard that existed in the UK very visibly, perhaps in Germany less so, about the the different kinds of kinship and forms of intimacy that are so fundamental to many uh, queer people's lives that were then completely uh, unaccounted for or, or uh, not considered. And I'm sure I know this, this has already popped up in the um, in previous talks in in the series, but that to me was was something really interesting to see how. A certain state form of, of kinship was uh, completely uh, asserted without uh, question, including by some by some uh, LGBT organizations, and which, for instance, advocated for for you know abstinence, sexual abstinence, complete abstinence. At the same time, it was interesting to see the reemergence or kind of a boom or a blooming of, of cruising in old school cruising in parks uh, in Hasenheide, in Berlin, in Hampstead Heath, in, in London. Uh, I mean, gay men were popping like mushrooms. You know, it's just like foraging. <laughs> it was, everyone was foraging during the pandemic. And, um, and, and that makes a kind of a really interesting brings a really interesting angle to, to the value that sex has for, for these communities, both to, as a form of sociability, of, of actually coming together in all its different kind of meanings uh, in, and of trying to, to get a sense of the social that responds to, to your own lives uh, and that is not being addressed by governments. Sorry, I spoke for a long time, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Ricky, thanks. Um, I mean, as you can imagine, based upon this, the, my presentation alone, I take a somewhat different tact. Um, I mean, for me, the social is a name for that imperative uh, that makes it difficult to feel okay to be alone and in solitude, right? Um, I mean, I'm too much of a Foucauldian uh, not to see the social as this, this mechanism and force uh, for the incitement to confess one's truths, to be recognized, to be included, right? The social is really just a cover for the kinds of forces that I was describing in my paper, right? The social is all on the side of potential, capacity, becoming, um, and all of that is inherently, and I would say, right, problematically ableist. Uh, this, this symposium coming out of disability studies uh, really needs to recognize the way in which this language of potential and capacity and being able to and so forth is completely ableist, right? It's the social that is what makes one feel left out. And we just have to look to social media <laughs> for, for proof of that, you know? So, you know, it's not a pretty <clears throat> description or definition of the social, but I don't think the social is very pretty, you know? Um, not necessarily, right? Not as this thing that we should aspire to, not as this, this I don't know, this kind of, yeah, this ideal, you know? Um, I mean, I think ideality when it runs in the domain of the social is a real problem. We know that, right? That's eugenics, that's whatever, I mean, you know, you name it. So um, yeah, that's what I would say. So, in a sense, the social is a kind of technology of surveillance. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and what I was trying to speak to is the extent to which we could, uh, and Adam Phillips, I think, speaks to this too, you know, we could never truly endure being included in everything on every platform, 
you know, having our sex wherever we wanted and seeing it and buying it and, you know, right? Like that's what we call total assimilation. That's what we call capture, you know? Um, I mean, my God, you know, in, in an era of, of the assimilating and mainstreaming of queer culture, it's time to start seriously thinking about wanting to be included all the time, you know? I, I have one more question, um, kind of related to that, um, that, that, that sort of, sort of social, uh, before, we, before we open up the floor to the audience. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always kind of thinking about the, the question of pleasure. Um, you know, there is pleasure in all of this. We talk a lot about sex and we talk a lot about pornography, especially those of us who have been writing about sex and pornography for quite some time. Um, and that, um, in my estimation, maybe it's a very limited estimation, I feel that the pleasure becomes another casualty of the conversation, another kind of object that kind of gets left behind. And I was wondering how kind of pleasure fits in all of this. I mean, is it, is it, is it about, you know, for instance, what John just said, you know, pleasure is in that it's always in excess of the social, or it is outside of the social, or the social has a way in which it controls or disciplines pleasure. At least that's how I understand what you're talking about. So I, I was wondering if each of you could uh, remark about pleasure a bit, or, or if you had any thoughts about how pleasure fits into our affairs. Um, I would say that my my book on on sex and play, it really started from reading a passage, uh, uh, a game studies piece that talks about uh, the need of not talking about the pleasures of of um, it's it's um, Michael Sicard uh, in game um, in play matters, uh, which is from like 2015 or something like that. Um, and he argues that we should stop talking about games in terms of fun um, and start talking about the different kinds of zones and realms of pleasure that can be very dark and strained and hurtful and asymmetrical, but at the same time crucial. And I think there, I mean, there is a lot of like mentions of pleasure. I'm not working in a psychoanalytical framework, so I'm not going to go into that discussion. Um, but I mean, there is a lot of talk about pleasure in cultural theory. There is a lot of pleasure in, in feminist takes, feminist and queer studies of porn, but it's especially looking at kind of fem feminist studies of sexuality, like the, you know, pleasure and danger um, discourse of, of, the, of the 80s, um, then the danger takes over and the pleasure uh, becomes like something as if it was one thing or obvious. Um, and I think it's completely under theorized in many, many frameworks um, in terms of what it what it can do and what it can be. Um, so I, I took great inspiration from Sylvan Tompkins's um, work actually um, on interest and excitement. I mean, excitement being the more intense form of, of interest. And he's talking about, there's the sentence that remained with me, which is basically um, that, that you know, we are what excites us. And he was talking basically of what makes a musician a musician. So very kind of straightforward idea of identity. But I think we are all made up of different excitements um, that can be completely conflicting. Uh, they are of different intensities um, and they shift in time and space as we encounter other bodies in time and space. Um, and I think like thinking of pleasure through that notion of excitement as something that crucially unmakes and both unmakes and remakes us or does and undoes at, at, at the same time. Um, I think it offers productive ways to not just think about pleasure as like, haha, I'm having, you know, such a great time or this is really enjoyable in a kind of flat sense 
because we can take pleasure in things that are completely that destroy us in very concrete ways. Um, so to talk about that um, that dynamic, I think think excitement as a relational um, and also a temporal concept can be highly highly useful. Yeah, I I, I would I would add to that, and I think pleasure and and I. I have written maybe a bit on pleasure when writing about chemsex. And I think there's an interesting tension around pleasure in, in our culture in that pleasure is that which allows our uh, capital to, to, to you know, circulate, allows you know, the economy we need to, to take pleasure in consumption and um, that's like the fundamental principle of, of life or we need to seek pleasure um, in order to buy things and at the same time pleasure can also very much exceed the, the the infrastructures that try to kind of regulate it and you see that again in 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 chem sex or, or ideas of risky sex. Um, you see it, for instance, in relation to antiretroviral drugs and PrEP. Um, they have an economic reality and they were kind of, they make people money, but at the same time, they have this potential to become uh, triggers or to sustain uh, marathons of sex according to the media uh, that would consider become a waste of time and so that would become unproductive or unable to be captured and um, so i think pleasure is is really interesting both in in how it is at the core of how our lives are structured but also there's it's it's kind of highly it's regulated in a highly neurotic way um, and i think you, we saw that a lot with with COVID, um, with calls for abstinence, for being alone, for you know, um, for taking pleasure. I don't know, knitting instead of fucking or something. Um, so I think it's kind of it's an interesting it's an interesting way in which in which pleasure is both needed but also a source of, of a lot of suspicion and fear. Yeah, um, for me, pleasure is there in my definition of, of sex um, because sex, I would define sex as the pleasure of losing oneself by falling into the self. So it's not sacrificial. Um, and, and yet it in such a way that at a certain point, the other becomes curiously irrelevant. Um, but the way I'm thinking about that irrelevancy is partly enabled by Agamben in his connection between the irrelevant and the contemporary, because it's the contemporary that, what is that quotation from early on in the paper, right? The attention, the attention to this unlived Agamben says is the life of the contemporary. That is that which can't be appropriated, right? But also that which cannot be sacrificed, right? Um, and so that's how you end up being contemporaries. That attention to the unlived would seem to be um, the opposite of Mari Ruti's subject who is forced to attend to the world, you know, uh, and pay attention, um, which doesn't sound like pleasure at all. It sounds like the police state or something. I don't know, coercive. Um, so. Um, I, I mean, I have a lot, a lot of questions, but uh, I think we might like the death for us to uh, move on to perhaps fill in some questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm gonna ask, 
um online oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah uh, Alice gonna help us steal some questions from the audience uh, okay. we have a couple questions but everyone feel free to write your questions in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll hope to get to them first question is from Alyssa who says hello I'm watching from the Philippines really glad I found this event um, really glad to do too. Uh, we'd just like to know whether the speakers have any thoughts on how class intersects or influences sex and slash during slash as the pandemic. I have a story. It's from Hasenheide Cruising Grounds in Berlin. Hasenheide has a long respected and valuable history as a cruising uh, location due to the, the kind of forest it has right behind where all the families uh, hang out on, on weekends. And, and the people they used to use to go to Hasenheide regularly were uh, local gay men, likely uh, mostly older and uh, German and very much uh, working class who could not access um, sex clubs due to, for instance, uh, price, financial reasons. Um, during the pandemic, um, there was a, a really 10 a, a really big tension that emerged in, in the case scene in Berlin, where all the middle class expats, uh, Americans working in tech in Berlin, uh, mostly or anecdotally, um, all took over Hasenheide, uh, left it to cruise and throw, and throw parties, to have sex, and left and leave rubbish. And this became a really big problem because then as a result of their carelessness of their not caring like the others who were there before them cared for the space that was of everybody. Um, increased police uh, presence um, happened, uh, patrols, uh, et cetera, and the previous locals who would go to the to the park to cruise were pushed out. So I think there's an interesting thing here around, around class dynamics as well, in terms of how uh, sex and, and how people seeking sex in different places uh, may have ended up taking the places that were the only places where others man, you know, were able to have sex. So it's just a little story, but I think that issue of privilege uh, class um, and the feeling that you can just access every wherever and have pleasure maybe relates to. In connection to my uh, to my talk, I would say that deplatforming. If we think about, for example, OnlyFans and what made OnlyFans such a success, was that people doing direct sex work. Uh, we're moving online for reasons of safety and also for financial reasons because customers uh, with the with the lockdowns uh, didn't have the mobility, um, and also people who find themselves in very precarious situations financially because of the pandemic uh, started doing like a sideline of business or experimenting with the possibilities of of OnlyFans, which then became it's not the only platform, but it has in this kind of monopolistic logic of social media, when, once something grows, it sort of sucks the life out of the scene and then it sort of sets the rules. So when, um, so in a way, um, precarity fed uh, OnlyFans, hence OnlyFans' decision, um, which they then <laughs> sort of uh, back down from uh, to ban porn. Uh, it was like a kind of a double insult because the, platform hasn't really been promoting um, so-called adult content. It's been promoting its cele celebrity uh, um, users. And I, I mean, the same thing, I did a short piece for the Porn Studies um, deplatforming thing with Carolina Are, 
um, on shadow banning and how something like Instagram um, shadow bans or otherwise demotes context content from, let's say, uh, pole dancers, strippers, people broadly engaging in, in sex work, when visual context that is content that is um, actually identical by celebrities, you know, Britney's topless dancing, it, you know, which is a joy to behold, it's sort of, you know, uh, it, it goes through where it's very similar, or even kind of safer content by, uh, by people associated with sex work doesn't. TikTok has been uh, removing, uh, banning, I mean, blocking accounts or just removing them, I think, um, from people who do completely safe content on TikTok, um, but also have an explicit presence on something like OnlyFans. So this cross-platform presence alone can be, um, can be uh, damaging. Financial deplatforming for a long time has been affecting sex workers. Um, because different payment systems, different platforms uh, are, have been ousting people doing direct sex work for a long time and hacking and hustling. The collective has been doing really important work on this. And this is directly, I mean, it's, it's directly about social privilege or lack thereof. It's about precarity and sex work and the power of platforms in very concrete ways to both uh, block people's visibility and in terms of the financial platforms uh, to block access to income. Okay, um, I think that, oh, sorry, my video is on. Apologies. Uh, I think next we will ask Fan to come online um, and to ask his question. Yeah, this is just a question to uh, Susanna. Um, I was curious about the comparison with the Chinese context of censorship, um, mainly because there's like two two differences that I've noticed recently. One being, uh, you know, the, the recent ban of the Chinese government of effeminate male figures um, that, you know, the, the ban crosses over uh, from sex into gender and gender representations and what that means. And also because the Chinese government itself is so involved in how censorship and media works. It's different, uh, slightly different than in the Western states where there is more of a distinction between governmentality um, and, um, and the corporations that you were speaking about. So I was just wondering if you had more information because I'm just beginning to think about uh, that, that comparison. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm hardly an expert when it comes to Chinese social media. Um, but I have a fantastic uh, PhD student, Lin Tsang, who's been, um, who's been uh, just yesterday, actually, um, was when we last met, who's been uh, educating me precisely on the, because if we think of platform capitalism of something like, you know, Facebook, um, it's a different creature from the much larger, actually, uh, Chinese uh, social, and, and I mean, centralization is similar, but the volume is, is also considerable. I mean, they're not larger than Facebook, but they are large um, in terms of in terms of regional density. But the kind of conflation of, of capitalism and then, you know, the, the socialist or communist that is and isn't, but they play into one another. Um, and how do and how these two forms of governance, that is the platform governance, uh, in a particular variation of platform capitalism, then um, supports um, the state uh, governmental uh, practices. So it's a, it's a very different, indeed, it's a very different configuration. It might seem similar um, in the sense that nudity and sexuality and definitely pornography have been ousted. Um, but in particular, when it comes to um, feminine, may, kind of male bodies or bodies considered male, uh, then it's also about the clashes between, as I far as understood, of you know homosexuality not being uh, criminalized, but having this very um, ambivalent pocket um, in terms of what is uh, allowed in the public eye and especially what is allowed in terms of organization. No, I mean I wish I had like insight, but I really don't. I, it's all from stuff that other people are doing. Um, I'm hoping that an article will soon be out in television new media that I reviewed um, on gay male uh, social kind of so sexual social media influencers um, who, I mean, Chinese 
uh, social media influencers who use uh, Twitter and doing this kind of, and then the, the balancing of different platforms um, and also the governance that extends almost to their Twitter presence and leads to their effacement um, in, on, on Chinese social media. Um, so I think there is it really interesting work being done, um, but not all of it is, I mean, nothing is ever all of it out, but I mean, the stuff that I've been reading recently, it's all still on kind of in process. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and this one is from Alexandria. Um, so this talk has seemed to focus a lot on paradoxes. I'm curious about the meta discussion of paradox and its aimed effect on us as listeners and contemplators. What are each of your personal experiences in contemplating the paradoxes presented today? What is the felt sense one experiences? What can one offer oneself or others from this place slash viewpoint? Thank you. I would love to take that. I think that's a great question. Um, and and I might, you know, I mean, there was a there was a bit of a of a, in, a reference in the paper um, being, uh, or at least at one point for a long time in my life, very sexually promiscuous. Um, it was always kind of a marvel to realize that no matter how sexually promiscuous I was, there were probably many more other and other types that I wasn't attracted to or that I never hooked up with. And that kind of paradox, right? Um, that way in which you try to then try to figure out how to how to resolve that, um, the mantle of promiscuity with um, with selection uh, and 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 um, exclusivity, you know, um, there is a paradox at the heart of promiscuity, um, which is that it's very exclusive, <laughs> um, or the one that Leo talks about, which I think was quoted by Joao um, from Receptive Bodies, which is you know the orgasm and that moment when you've just orgasmed. And you go somewhere, right? I mean, and your partner might even say, where did you go? Like meaning physically, mentally, consciously, you're not there, right? You've fallen into yourself. Um, and you thought that, you know, it was precisely by being with that other person that this happened, that this was enabled. And yet the paradox is that somehow that person sort of drops away and is no longer there, right? And then the third one, of course, is cruising in which you wait and wait and wait. And yet paradoxically never feel bored or lonely. You know, I mean, I think these are real world. Uh, they're my experiences, you know. I would say I haven't really been thinking through the notion of paradox, but I've been thinking through ambiguity a lot. And it's sort of, I'm obsessed with the notion of ambiguity in particular in relation to affect and, and my dependent distracted board book, which is not an unhappy book independent of the title. I don't think it's markedly that it's about effective ambiguity. So trying to think of, of dependence in connection with any form of agency, I mean, very broadly construed or boredom as always playing with interest and excitement and distraction basically being about modulations of attention. Um, to try and I think drinking through ambiguity, it's it's very different from um, it's it's not about kind of relativist. It sort of depends. It's about things being uh, simultaneously uh, completely contradictory things, and I think uh, Xi'an Ngai's um, take on aesthetic categories. It's like bo where boredom feeds interest. Um, and, and seemingly uh, mutually contradicting and paradoxical, maybe, um, um, dynamics um, actually uh, require and depend and upon one another and feed one another. So I've been interested in, um, it's a bit like my interest in the notion of pleasure as being rife with contradiction. So it doesn't become resolved into one thing ever, 
and that's what makes it dynamic. Um, I think um, ambiguity, it's not an easy framework for thinking with, because then you end up being kind of wishy-washy very easily. But I think especially thinking about um, affect and the way that affect is mobilized, uh, also in contemporary politics as very firm affect theories, in a sense. Um, I think, I mean, that's what I'm interested in doing at the moment is, is really trying to, I mean, I'm not trying to ask, I'm asking like what happens when we approach affect through the notion of ambiguity, what happens um, to ways of conceptualizing affect and, and living with it um, and theorizing with it not that far with it really but that's what I've been trying to do most of the year I haven't been that successful but I've you know I'm halfway through a chapter so something will come out of it I'm not sure it will be pretty but I think it's really crucial um, because in a way if we don't stick we always know when we study society and culture that things are complex and ambiguous and and things that thrillers also might destroy us. I mean, cruel optimism, balance discussion is one example of this, I would say, fundamental ambiguity. And at the same time, there is this much more, I would say, for, there's a firm need for firm outcomes and firm arguments where complexity becomes effaced. And I think there's a real danger for cultural critique to then um, comply to the logic of sound bites, um, of kind of social media sound bite economy economy um, so that the reasons why we are doing this work you know in in order to attend to the complexities that exist um, become kind of a phased um, and I think this this my particular interest has been uh, in relation to research done about social media and and how certain kind of critical discourse uh, ends up simplifying in ways that actually reproduces the logic that it studies uh, but I think it, it sort of scales to contemporary culture more broadly. Yeah, I will just add something very shortly. I mean, again, I, I, I would agree with Susanna that the idea of the paradox may make us overlook other things. Um, I mean, I like the tension and I, and again, uh, positive and negative, you know, forces, affects, uh, which don't, you know, they they do not need to be paradoxical. They may be just in intention. There may be dissonances. Sorry, Susan, I'm using a lot of your words. Uh, there may be dis dissonances. Um, and I mean, just the example to go back to the to the example that that John gave of cruising, that one waits and does not get bored. I mean, I think it is a, one could consider the paradox if the 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 standpoint is we one is waiting for something. Uh, if cruising is just the the pursuit of sex, but if cruising becomes a way of moving, a way of navigating, a way of in, occupying space, of of relating to to other people, that that waiting regardless of whether or not one achieves the ultimate aim of, of the orgasm that one might have thought we went there to seek uh, that game of cruising actually there's no the waiting is, is is play itself you know it's not that it's not the sex that is the game is the play you know it's not the victory that is the game it's the play itself that is the game um, and one doesn't get bored when, when, when one plays, right? So if one plays well. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, I think it depends a lot on, on where are we putting our focus. Uh, and maybe assuming a paradox leads us to, to maybe to not, not pay attention to other other. other parts of the same phenomenon. Thanks a lot, Joel. Um, I just uh, you know, at the very end, so I just want to thank all the panelists for your amazing, amazing uh, observations and your remarks. Um, 
and uh, I want to end the audience, but I'm in out. Uh, if you've been here for the last six months, that's a lot of commitment. And if there's just a lot in on, uh, that's also a form of commitment. Um, so I want to thank everyone for being out here, for logging on, for letting you have been logging on. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and I also want to add the access team for the, the interpretation. And uh, I wouldn't be able to put a series on the, uh, the assistance of Ali, who has been both my left and my right hand during this whole process. Uh, so I really want to extend the answer to that. I also want to add Stan for the um, his social media uh, like reading. Um, so the holdings of the whole series will be available on the series website in the next couple of weeks. So keep checking, uh, hopefully by some time in early November. Uh, and yeah, thanks a lot and stay safe. And Hope to see you around soon in person. Bye all.